Hey there, Philip here, and this is a snippet about Google I.O. 2024, which I attended last week. And that was the first time I was there as an attendee. In the previous years, I mean, not the previous years, they were they didn't even have Google I.O. in some uh, previous years because of COVID. But uh, before that, for a long time, I visited I.O. as an organizer and later as a speaker. So it was pretty cool for me to be there as an attendee and just like getting, you know, the information and not caring that much about others <laughs> and just like having fun and so on and so forth, being entertained. So I thought it would be interesting to give you like a, um, a, a walkthrough of what I liked and didn't like and what I'd learned. It's clearly very personal and very subjective. If you want an objective uh, take on Google I.O., you probably should go to like some kind of an online resource other than me, right? But uh, I, I thought it might be interesting. Uh, so uh, what is Google I.O.? Google I.O. is a conference for developers that is being held uh, by Google since I think 2009. And uh, I think the first time I was there was 2012 or something like this. And then mostly every year I, I went. And uh, it is being held, uh, originally it was being held, I think, in San Francisco, and then they moved to Mountain View. And uh, as every conference, it is not, you know, a conference is not documentation. As I like to say, uh, conferences are meant to to evoke emotions and to create relationships and to uh, yeah to support excitement and stuff like this, right? So this is pretty important to realize that conferences are not just there for you to just sit and listen because you can do that alone. Uh, it's probably much much more effective. It's definitely much more effective to just go into docs online and read the stuff <laughs> but uh, oftentimes and for me the most important thing is that you can actually meet people face to face and talk to them right not just the people at google but uh, sometimes more importantly the people that are around google that uh, use the same things that that you do right so yeah, Google I.O. exists because Google has a bunch of platforms and technologies that you built upon. So for example, you know, you have Android and so Android in itself is nothing, but there's a bunch of people who make apps and games for Android. And so uh, that's, you have to kind of know how to do it, right? Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, so it's important for you to talk to other people who do this, but also talk to Google and to talk to people at Google uh, to find out how to do this. All right, so that's that's the conference and that's the telling of story, you know. Uh, well, I'll get to it. Well, actually, yeah. Uh, let's just get to the keynote. The keynote uh, is, you know, the first session in a, at every I.O. and every event like this, and it is the most important in terms of excitement and and all this um, storytelling, right? And uh, in at this I.O., it was all about AI. Surprise, surprise. It was all about artificial intelligence. And normally I would say, ugh, because I am not like, a, you know, I'm not 100% sold that AI is like the, the only thing that we should care about right now. Uh, but on the other hand, from the perspective of telling a story, um, it went really well for Google, I think. Um, it was, you know, normally sometimes these conferences and these keynotes are like, oh, look at this, and also look at this, and also look at this. And this keynote um, was just, you know, the, the story was Google is the state of the art. Uh, you know, Google AI is the, the state of the art. Uh, we're the best. This is the reasons why we're the best. This is how we are doing everything uh, right. And that's it, right? So um, 
I actually I wanted to show you something so that you don't only uh, look at my face. So this is the, the keynotes. You can actually watch them now, so you don't need to, to listen to, to me if you want the original article. Uh, but um, what I noticed and everyone else noticed that they talk basically only about AI and just, you know, make little... Uh, threats through the other products that Google has like oh yeah but yeah we have Android who look AI in Android you know and so on and forth forth um, and the and again from the perspective of telling a story I think that went really well actually while I was sitting next to my former colleague and, and friend who uh, was reading Twitter you know while she was watching the keynote and at some at one point at the during the keynote which again was all about AI. She showed me the uh, like a tweet that linked to stock prices for Google, and you know before keynote the stock prices were like flat, and then after the keynote and during the keynote suddenly <laughs> stock prices went up, and they they took um, I mean they kept going up the whole keynote until the end and probably after that, right? So clearly the story worked because, you know, that doesn't mean like if stock prices go up, it doesn't mean that the, the company does something right. It only means, it's sometimes it does, but it only means that the people with money who invest in stocks think that the company does something right. And what helps a lot in this respect is if the company can give them a good story. So clearly a lot of people with money uh, care about AI and clearly they thought this was like they understood what Google was telling them. So, uh, so yeah, and stories are, again, stories aren't lists. It's, it's not like we are doing AI, we are doing Android, we are doing something. It, to tell a story, you have to have other conjunctions than and. For example, and therefore, or but, you know. So I guess like a story for the keynote could be like, uh, you know, Google has a bunch of things, but we care, but, but all of them have AI in them. And therefore uh, you can, you know, use things in the Google ecosystem and it will be very intelligent. But, you know, and so on and so forth. So th these are stories. Anyway, so, so yeah, if you, if you think about, I, I think if you think about it this way, it was very successful uh, and it was clearly meant to be like that, right? Next time, if you see a conference, either from Apple or Microsoft or Google or whoever else, uh, you can keep track of these things and see like, oh, okay, no, so this is the story they're trying to tell now. Cool. So uh, let's let's keep talking about AI because that was the main thing. Um, the the reason, and I think would lend it really well for them, uh, the reason why people should think, according to Google, that Google is at the top of the AI ladder, is uh, two. There are two. Uh, they are investing in multimodality of AI, which means that you don't only talk in text um, to the AI, and it doesn't just respond in text back, but that you can put things like photos and videos and pictures, and you can just like say like, hey, like, uh, for example, here's a one hour video, and I want you to find uh, the scene that I'm just drew on this piece of paper. And the, um, uh, the AI is smart enough to be like, even though your paintings or your drawing is really terrible, it can find the frame or the part of the video that you're probably thinking of, right? They actually show the demo like that. So pretty impressive stuff. Uh, and, and useful, right? Because you don't, it's hard to explain everything in, in text. And the other thing, so that's multimodality, and the other thing is context window, which is very important. That's just how basically the working memory of the AI, right? Normally, it's uh, you know in the 
in the start, like with GPT-3 and stuff like this, it was a few like thousand tokens. So that if you talked to the computer for even just like 10 minutes, it didn't know what happened at the start of the conversation, right? But you don't want that. And especially you don't want that with, with something uh, more involved. Like you would like to give the AI like 17 uh, papers, like scientific papers and ask it questions. Uh, if you have a big enough window, then that's possible. Uh, if not, then it's not. Basically, it's not possible. You can try to to do to to go around it, but basically, it's not possible. So, so yeah, that, and that's very helpful. So that's multimodality and context window. Uh, on the other hand, there's still a lot of dependability issues around around AI, uh, and that means. They, of course, didn't show it in the keynote, but it's still the case that you sometimes ask the AI something and it very confidently tells you something that's not true, just not true, right? And even if it's just 10% or 5% or 1% of the replies, and I think it's more than 1%, uh, then it almost ruins the whole thing um, in, in some cases, right? So there are, there are two two ways to use AI, I guess, roughly, right? One of them is more like inspiration. Like if you are like, okay, tell me a story about X or make a poem about something, you don't really care if something fails about the poem, right? Like if there's something that doesn't really make sense and it definitely doesn't matter if like a poem or like a bedtime story has something about it that's not completely correct, right? So that's one thing, and for that, AI is amazing. <laughs> Already amazing. For example, the way I use AI um, uh, often, or not that often, but sometimes, you know, in programming, you need to name something, like you have a new class or subsystem, and you need to find out what is the name of this class or subsystem. And this name is going to be important because this is basically your like language. You're creating a new language from the API or the or the way that you name things in your program. And so it is one of the things that is supposed to be the hardest uh, uh, for programmers is to come up with these names for these very, very abstract things that they create, right? Well, not anymore, because you can literally, and I do this once in a while, you can literally go to an AI and say, okay, I have this new class or I have this new subsystem and it does this, this and this. It doesn't do this, this and this. How should I call it? Give me, uh, you know, 50 examples. And it gives me 50 examples and some of them are stupid, but some of them are good. And then I pick the best one and, and I'm done. Right. So so that's that's definitely helpful. Now, that's the kind of the creative or more like, uh, you know, free form uh, way of using AI. The problem arises when you kind of need the AI to be correct all the time. And that is a lot of things um, like for example you know you can you can ask the AI to write code for you uh, already and sometimes it does well but sometimes it does terrible and it, again it it does terrible yet it sounds very convincing right so so you you ask the AI like please you know write this piece of code that does this and it it is formatted and it it is well documented and it looks like something a PhD student would write, right? So you're very happy and then you hopefully you read through it very carefully and then you realize there's like there's there are mistakes that not even a novice programmer would do, right? But it just like looks good, but it's complete bullshit. So and that's some obviously something that you can work with. So it feels like unless AI improves very significantly, we are going to use it for some things, but not for other things. Um, and there's good reasons to believe that AI won't 
I mean, there are reasons to believe both that it will actually improve significantly, but there's also reasons to believe that it won't uh, improve. Um, people don't want to hear it, especially people who are invested in AI, but it is possible that, you know, there's a, there's a limit. Um, I mean, not, not in the long run, but like on in a medium term, there seems to be a limit in what the AI can do. Um, okay, so the, yeah, um, I'll uh, hopefully I'll put something in the comments about this. All right, so that's the that's the problem with AI, and like I talked to a lot of people in Silicon Valley last week, and most of the people or all of the people that I really trust uh, kind of hate the hype around AI, and they can't wait for AI <laughs> hype to die, to be honest. Uh, so uh, nobody says that AI is useless or anything like that, but there's definitely this kind of like, yeah, it's overhyped. Um, all right. Why is AI hype? This is something else that I realized that uh, is probably a good thing to, to understand is that Silicon Valley and like tech, the tech industry n desperately needs a big innovation, right? The last big innovation was mobile. It something like 2008, right? iPhone and Android and, and all this. That was a big thing that like changed, literally changed society, changed the world. Lots of people and lots of companies made lots of money on mobile. Uh, lots of things had to change because of mobile. So big deal, right? Before, you know, mobile, there was the internet, the web, the World Wide Web was just 10 years prior about, you know, about like that time. And it was also a huge, huge thing for everyone, for the tech industry, but also for society. Before that, there was the personal computer in the, let's say, 80s, right? So it was like almost every decade, there was something huge. And and after mobile, that's basically nothing. You know, you could say like, oh, but what about VR? Really? Like, like VR is, I'm sure, great, but it's not on the level of the web or mobile, right? Same with cryptocurrencies and stuff like that. So, so like right now, especially the cap capitalists in Silicon Valley are like, "Ooh, this is it! We have it! It's finally, finally something that we can throw money uh, at and get the investment back." And so that's what they do. And I, I, I guess I get it, right? So, so uh, if imagine that you're in the early 1900s and you have like a bicycle factory, and then suddenly people are starting to talk a lot more than before about cars right and so like you have two options you can either ignore it and be like oh another fad we'll just go on making bikes and not touch motors because wow um or you can be like you know what i will actually do it and I will actually create like change my company into something that creates cars or motorbikes and suddenly uh, and you, you know you could be wrong but you could also be very correct and uh, uh, change the company into something that is much more successful so that's I think a lot of what is happening right now at the top of many tech companies not just in Silicon Valley obviously where they're like okay uh, this could be huge. We don't know that it will be huge, uh, but we need to push hard uh, because uh, if we don't and some and other people do, then we could be left alone in the old world. We don't want to be the dinosaur, right? So that's why. All right, I, 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 uh, at I.O., uh, again, because I, I feel like conferences are more about talking to people. I did not go to many talks because I can watch them from uh, here, from my home, from my office. Um, and I can read the documentation and it's probably better. Uh, so I talked a lot with people. Uh, 
not just during IO, obviously, also during the other days that I was there, but uh, I just w talk. There are only two or three, uh, two, just two in the full two days. Apart from the keynote, there are only two talks that I actually attended. One of them was about AI, like dialogues between some AI researchers um, and like thought leaders. And that was uh, interesting. That was interesting to hear that they are really pushing on reasoning in AI. So like trying to have the AI actually um, use reasoning and not just intuition, because that's what the LLMs like ChatGPT for are basically about it. Like it's intuition, right? You also want the AI to actually reason about stuff. So they're working on it and apparently there's some progress, so that's good. Uh, it was also good to un understand things like, okay, so AIs are already really, really helpful to do flood prediction. Like they can predict floods seven to ten days ahead of time, which is something that no other model could do before. And therefore they are literally saving like hundreds of thousands of lives. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, good, good job AI. <laughs> uh, and then it was interesting to hear about the retrieval augmented generation RAG, where a AI doesn't just need to, th to like talk to its own head um, again, intuition based, but it can have what they call vector databases where it's like I can I can query like a memory that is much larger and that is hopefully more real or it contains things that are that we know that are true. Uh, part, you know, anyway, I don't I want all this to uh, to be all about AI. So uh, the one demo that I went to, uh, Google I.O. always has demos of like new things. Uh, it was Project Starline, so I'm going to show you what it looks like. Uh, so this is basically like a, like a Zoom meeting, uh, but you have a big screen and it is it looks 3D like. Uh, as you can see here, uh, it's not perfect. I think it looks a little better now nowadays than uh, than it looked when they made this article. Um, but uh, the the idea is that you sit in front of this kind of screen, and it feels like just behind the screen on the other side there's another person, and it's 3D. Like it, you're not wearing any 3D glasses, but you see the other person as if they were. 3D show us the thing. Yeah, it's hard to, I'm sure it's hard to record because it is literally, I think how it works is that uh, some cameras around you will find out where your head is and then somehow do it so that the wherever you are watching, it changes what, what's on the screen. So it literally think, it literally looks like you are looking at a person on the other end of the screen. It's, it's really cool. And it's, you know, when I talked a lot about immersion and about like, we, we need technology that is less immersive, not more. This is what I mean. This is part of what I mean is that like, this is not us putting on big VR things. Uh, it's, it's like, it seems like a, um, a normal part of your environment, like a little, you know, portal window to another, uh, you know, place. I was, the demo uh, was just very short. They put me into a booth and then they started this, this project, uh, this, you know, big screen and on the other hand at the other end of the screen there was a google employee that was sitting somewhere in silicon valley somewhere else than at google io and we just talked and it felt very very you know it wasn't perfect you could see that it's like 3d right like, like here uh yeah like you know you can see the kind of like the polygons there a little bit but it's it's fine it's very close to what you'd normally um, see in real life. So, so it almost feels like you're there. 
um, yeah, it's good. And of course, it's very expensive. Uh, I'm sure it's, I mean, it's not even in uh, production yet, but but it will be very expensive. And for, for the first few years, if it's successful, it will be only used by big companies um, or something like that. But uh, in the future, you know, these things get cheaper. So, so that's cool. All right. So that's that's the uh, that's the one demo that I went to. And the last thing that I want to talk about, I have four minutes. Well, uh, is the general vibe in Silicon Valley that I got from visiting and talking to people. And I think uh, one thing to to note is for people who have for people outside this uh, this bubble, it is it is easy to think of Silicon Valley as this, you know, bubble of tech bros and, you know, bad people, basically, you know, bad, rich people. And that's not how I see it. The, the way that, like, you know, the, the people that I know in Silicon Valley are not tech bros. They are people who genuinely care about things. Uh, yes, they are successful. They Their careers are successful, uh, but they don't, you know, they live not too far from what you probably live, you know, because Silicon Valley, yeah, you have a bunch of money, but you also spend a lot of mon bunch of money just by living in Silicon Valley. So, you know, don't, don't think of, uh, that, you know, all Silicon Valley people, um, are just like crazy, uh, crazy rich and, you know, uh, they'll live similar to your standard of living. And, and yeah, and they're not tech bros. <laughs> they, I mean, there are definitely tech bros in Silicon Valley. Don't get me right, wrong, but the people I know are not. Right? So just that you understand this. Um, and there are smart people who care. Um, they they definitely all feel the the hype and and the kind of the the push towards more like businessy things. It seems like because of the. You know the good times are over vibe that's in Silicon Valley right now. Uh, it is harder to find to work and to keep work, and so people are more nervous, and uh, that also means that uh, uh, even in companies that where where people were kind of nice to each other, now they're less nice, and people do more politics and. Just, you know, um, we call it uh, like having having sharp elbows uh, doing this basically more. And so that's um, disappointing to many people who were there and kind of thought that it's normal for people to or it can be normal for people to just work on stuff together and not really care about politics and, and trying to be better or, you know, um, to take credit for things and so on and so forth. So that's not good. Um, yeah, and so, some people, you know, uh, have mortgage in Silicon Valley. Like if you have mortgage, in, uh, if you have a house and kids in Silicon Valley, you kind of have to, your expenses are much larger <laughs> than, uh, than almost anywhere else in the world. And so uh, you are basically locked in some ways to uh, to being there, you know. Like uh, for me, it was it wasn't the case, but maybe if I stayed there for three, four more years or just two years, I don't know. Then suddenly, you know, the kid is it's it's harder to explain to the kid that we're going to some weird, you know, Central European country that you've almost never seen, and so on and so forth. So yeah, uh, kind of melancholy feeling in Silicon Valley. Anyway, um, well, I hope this was interesting. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye.